Okay, let's start. So, everybody, uh, I'm really excited that you stayed for so, such late hour. It's really nice to see you all here. And actually, it's really nice to see people in person because until now, I think for two years, we were doing all kinds of meetups, including Careful Summit in, in Zoom. And now it's a different experience. So, let's start. Uh, Work? Second, guys? Okay. Work. Okay. So, my name is Evgeny. Uh, I'm CTO and co founder of Tatabond AI. And um, I think I kind of relate to all this orchestration thing uh, for a long time. So, for probably the last 18 years already, I was doing something related to pipelines, to orchestration, to automation, to moving data from one place to another. So, this is kind of what I like to do. Uh, besides all other things, and uh, let's go continue. Uh, so, in Databend AI, what we do, we like to provide and we like to help people work with reliable pipelines. So, all of us here was talking a lot about how to test their pipelines, how to make them reliable, how to achieve SLA. So, this is what we do. We really like to get to, to the place that our engineer who works with us can say that his pipelines are good. And they deliver really good data. So this is us. There's even like a small preview on our UI. But <coughs> let's start the meetup. Um, so from my experience, and I, I, I think I, I have seen a lot of different environments and a lot of different people. When we talk about Airflow, we always talk about deployment, right? It's like every another presentation, we're going to talk how to deploy Airflow how to do things in Aeroflow, or how to like, you know, integrate another Kubernetes kind of deployment or integrate another, some orchestration to on top of Aeroflow so you can deploy it. So this is very you know, hot topic. And, I, and I'm kind of wondering, I'm surprised that it's like 2022 and we're still talking about this. It's still happening. We still think how to deploy Aeroflow. So I'm just going to share my last experience from my last year. I, I talked to a few guys in our company and I kind of asked them how you manage your airflows. And I was surprised they were doing it in a really tough way. Like, you know, when they, now let's go into it. Um, okay, so they were using Kubernetes. They were using a lot of things around it. They were deploying airflow and they were spending a lot of time on this. So what the main goal for our lecture today is kind of to achieve some interesting knowledge. Uh, what's the difference between Airflow Kubernetes and like Airflow running on Kubernetes and local executor and everything else? Uh, to understand what the advantage of all kinds of deployments that we have in Airflow and Make sure that we use the best option for ourselves. Okay. So this is a joke. It's from Twitter. Uh, one, try, one time I tried to explain Kubernetes to my friend, and we and they both didn't understand anything, and it happened. So definitely there are people who understand Kubernetes a lot. They really you know, they specialize in Kubernetes. Uh, the only thing I think this is the part of their job. They, what they do day to day, they board, they configure Kubernetes. When you move to data engineer, it doesn't happen every day. You want to run your DAGs. You don't want to make you know, understand why your deployment or service or some secret doesn't work in Kubernetes. So if you go forward, so when I start to look, like you know, I heard the Airflow should run on Kubernetes. Everybody said it actually. I also counted today, like all previous lectures said that they run Airflow on Kubernetes. So then I go to Google and I start to search like Apache Airflow production, I'll see some amount of results. If I start to search Apache Airflow Kubernetes, I see like almost one million of results. So that's definitely the way of doing things. So I feel like, you know, I know my deployment. I understood that <laughs> Kubernetes is good. This is what I want to do. And I start to use it. And then I start to discover a lot of interesting things. First of all, I will try to deploy it on my machine. And to, but that, it depends what, what you use, but Minikube kind, it will not work. Like it's very, you have to be lucky that it's going to be work on your local machine. 
יותר גדול בביגוד. You deploy in Kubernetes and you just find out that deployment is stuck. So what to do next? It's also a good question. You deploy it again, the deployment works great, but you know, there is no secrets. So it's still not doing what you exactly expect them from it to, 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 to do. And then like, you did already all good, and then it's still stuck because you forgot to push the image. Okay, and all this I'm doing just to run some docs in my development. So, actually, I think the main mistake that I made like, a few days ago when I searched for the first Google query, I didn't wait enough. If I was waiting enough in my search query, I will find out that the deployment, like, you know, Kubernetes deployment is the second one, which is also Kubernetes operator, and there's also Kubernetes executor. So when people say that they deploy on Kubernetes, when people say that they deploy on Kubernetes, it doesn't exactly mean that they do something very specific that I can understand. It, they somehow run things on Kubernetes, it's definitely true, but I don't know what exactly they're doing, and I'm not sure that what I'm doing is the right thing to do. Okay. So let's take a look on all these options. And I think from the first lecture, we remember the guys said they run their own Kubernetes operator, uh, and then there's Kubernetes, official Kubernetes, Kubernetes operator, and then there is Kubernetes executor, and then there is have deployment. All this relates to Kubernetes, right? So what's the difference? The first one runs somewhere, but it submits user code to Kubernetes. So the Docker image will go to Kubernetes and run there, but still the code of the Python operator itself can run any place. Then you go to the second option. There's no, it's a variation of the first one, so the same answer. But then you go to Kubernetes Executor. What we know, that the scheduler who runs this Kubernetes Executor is actually run somewhere, I don't know where. But I definitely know that the Airflow task itself will run on Kubernetes. And then, when you talk about Helm deployment, I know that the scheduler itself runs on Kubernetes. It submit tasks somewhere. I don't know if it's going to be Kubernetes or not. It can be actually, I know, some other environment. Okay? So it's always a combination between deployment, executor, and operator. So here kind of, I start to understand that Kubernetes is tough, and it's like, it took me right now, I think, five minutes to even prepare the explanation, to start to explain, and now I need to do it for every person in my company. It's like, it's going to be a really tough job to start to onboard every engineer with all this explanation, how they're going to deploy, how going to do it, how they're going to debug their code. So then I started to talk to these people, ask like, what you're actually trying to do, and I tried to scope the problem. So the scoping of the problem actually bring me to some not standard idea of deploying Airflow. Like everybody likes to deploy, deploy Kubernetes. Everybody sometimes run Airflow, some, uh, some custom deployments. Docker Compose. So this is a quick question, who use here Airflow? I think you are using. And who use Airflow on Docker Compose? Okay, there's one guy. That's all. So I think it's a, I have an opportunity to convince you here, like you know, why you can use this option as well, and why it's going to be good for your day-to-day, I, -day, I know, life, uh, lifestyle work balance, so you don't spend too much on Kubernetes. You're actually going to spend a lot of time on Airflow, and I think this is a good thing. You'll be creating better tags, you'll be creating better code, you'll be iterating more, and then you'll be able to create much better projects like, you know, that have seen really creative, nice Airflow tags in the previous um, two hours. So I just I think what I what mentioned to say, because I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with Docker Compose, it's actually an old tool. So we use Airflow because it's robust, it's good, it's from 2015, everybody's using it. So I think the same goes for Docker Compose. When I, as a software engineer, not as a data engineer, develop something on my local machine, I'm going to use this a lot. It's a really nice thing and I, like everybody forgot about it. Uh, so when I test web servers, I'm going to test it locally, I'm not going to deploy it to Kubernetes. When I have something really complicated like Airflow, for some reason I go to Kubernetes. So, looks nice. Uh, it's simple, and there is also, you know, also there is an official Docker Compose by 
Apache Airflow. So you can just download this file, run one command, and you have Airflow running on your machine. Okay, now let's talk about Airflow.compose. Uh, I'll explain one bullet by bullet. So we have dark mounts. That means they can just run Docker Compose. This will spin a lot of Docker's with Airflow. Every Docker will run some service of Airflow. It might be scheduler, it might be worker, it might be web server. All of them need DAGs. So there is one nice option in Docker Compose. It doesn't exist in, in Kubernetes. You can easily mount your files. So next time you want to change the document to see how it affects your run, you can easily do it and automatically will be picked up by your Airflow. You don't need to commit. You don't need to sync anything. You can just offer your DAGs on the spot, like inside your PyCharm or whatever you use. Second thing, searchable logs. Again, Airflow has logs. You can always go to the logs, to the logs tab on Airflow. You can always, if you have some external system, maybe search for them, but it doesn't compare to being able to see all logs of Airflow <laughs> in one place on your local machine and can easily just you do find all in your logs or see them. Uh, refresh them, copy paste them. It's really nice to see to have it all in the side of your environment. It's really easy to change because you kind of own the config. You don't deploy the Kubernetes when you have Helm chart and stuff. Easy. And it's really easy to, to deploy. I don't need to run through some CI CD. I don't need to do well, complicated things to make sure that my Docker has been published, then I need to trigger CI CD, then my Kubernetes will run, I will do Helm, I will do something, it's it's simple. So I think at this point of time I can stop talking about some features, but I can have a really nice feature Docker Compose or whatever. I can actually start to talk about my use case. I think this is the most important most important one. Like what action I'm going to do. Because if I just compare Docker Compose Together with Helm chart, Helm chart wins. Like I'm going to compare Helm chart or another managed service of Airflow with Docker Compose, it's better. So it's knows Helm is better. It's not how, how to scale. It's kind of production grade. My DevOps guys really know how to use this thing. It's very easy for them. They said how to create a production service for me, but they don't understand that. In day-to-day -day job, I just want to optimize my Docker image. And I think in all the things that we do in Airflow, it's really important because it's different from backend. It's different from frontend. It's different from a lot of services. We talk to our machine learning guys, and they have a lot of requirements. We put new and new operators inside Airflow. They require more libraries. We trying to do a lot of things inside our Docker. So in order to be able to iterate quickly in my Docker. I really want to do some something simple. I want to build locally. I want to be able to run it locally. So that can be done with Docker Compose. I want to debug Airflow. That's you know, it's probably it's some prodigy thing to say. Like everybody knows that Airflow, is, it runs. So when it runs, it's all good. When it doesn't, it's like, OK, let's call the guy. There's a guy who knows how to fix things. It is a guy who knows how to go to Kubernetes log and fight real, for the real reason. So here comes again, I can debug things. Just imagine you're running Docker Compose on a local machine. It runs the database. You can easily you know, configure the, some environment variables, and you can start running DAGs locally. You can use your PyCharm. It doesn't require, again, a lot of abstraction to put that. And the last one. Yeah, and last one, sometimes I, I know, oh, a lot, I want to test some integration. And usually it requires like, okay, so I I understand Airflow supports EMR operator, I can deploy to the cluster, and then I need to do a, at least one week cycle with the DevOps guy, so they can enable access from the cluster to our EMR, or something similar. So it's always about the like, Kubernetes is managed by, not by me. Here, we can easily go and provide credentials from my local machine, and I can start working on this deck. I can start to work on integrating on this operator. I can do, I can, I can finish my job early and 
go home really early. Okay, so I think I'll pause now a second when we are you know, not too many people, not too many people here in the room. So, in case you have any questions until the slide, and you can raise your hand and repeat it. And okay. no questions. Let's continue. So, when we talk about this local deployment that I'm trying to, you know, to say, guys. This is something that we forgot to use. This is something that we can use easily. This is something we can do for our friend who is struggling going around airflow and Kubernetes. There are some you know, small gotchas we need to remember. Definitely there's Docker image, there's Airflow CFG. Airflow CFG on the local machine doesn't equal to Airflow CFG that runs inside Docker. So we can just use environment variables to define everything. When I run Airflow Docker on my machine, I can just set up these two variables, airflow home and airflow core scalable connection, maybe more for security, and I can just get access to the deployment, local deployment that I have, and I can start run my airflow test command or airflow, whatever I want to do with airflow, and I can test things. And mouse is a really important one for the new airflow. There is a new execution system, there is a new executor inside airflow that actually doesn't create a new process every time it runs Airflow. It spawns a new, like, you know, a sub-process. So if you have months with the code, you may be sure, be sure that you don't use this fork mode. Otherwise, your, die, your Python code will not be loaded again. Okay. Yeah, so until this point, I kind of was trying to say, guys, let's, let's think about the other side. We cannot always use Kubernetes. And we should do Docker Compose. And I probably everybody take a look on me and saying, guys, this guy is crazy. Like, how can we run our production without our Kubernetes cluster? But also, you don't have to. I think the, the truth is that, we, that you can mix between different approaches for different use cases. So when you run production, we use Kubernetes. We use Helm, we use Community Edition, we use Official Edition. We can use Managed Services. There are a lot of options we can choose to run production. When I need to do stuff quickly, iterate fast, change code, change requirements, change configuration, this is a good one. And from the experience I got, people kind of understand Docker Compose. This is a really good thing about it. I have to spend less, I don't say hours, but less, I don't know, Less means every day than to explain to somebody how to use Kubernetes. Okay. So, what challenges we had to solve? When we done all this, we had this local deployment, we had power, well, centralized deployment, the dark deployment, credentials, many others is still the issue. You need to know how to update the dark files, so locally you can do it like this. If you deploy to Helm, you need to understand what technique you're going to use. I'm going to use Gitsync, I'm going to do every build image every time. Managing connections, as I said before, also it's also the thing. The environment of the Docker Compose on the local machine and the environment inside Helm might be different. You might want to do like to have different things, and that's something to take care. Of. And then I think the important thing also here is uh, when you use Airflow Helm out of the box just to deploy some you know, playground and to see how it works. Uh, it's amazing. You just deploy it, you know, it runs some Helm command and it's really nice, you can use it. But then it comes to the place then you start to integrate your Airflow with the production. And from our experience, we have a lot of configuration side of production. So there are different techniques. Some people will integrate Vault, some people integrate other things. We usually see, I usually see people trying to integrate a lot of things using Helm chart. There's an option to provide variables and connections. And it makes the deployment very, very tough. It's like you cannot control it from outside. There is some YAML that you need to inject inside the Helm chart. And no, and then when you have Docker Compose, it doesn't, it's not compatible in any way. Docker Compose doesn't have it at all. So what we have done, we introduced a simple script that can run Airflow command 
that will automatically create all wars and connections so I can port my environments from Helm to local Airflow on Docker Compose. And even more, when I really need to debug something, something definitely doesn't work, and it's like it's like it's a very tough problem, and this problem happens every week. I can configure easily my local airflow that runs in sub process of my machine, and I can easily debug that one. Okay. Um, questions so far? All good. Should I go? Uh, so we have a question from Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is how do you test and use the Kubernetes code to wrap all of the world? Okay, so the question is about Kubernetes operator locally. So let's discuss it. So in this case, when you have Kubernetes operator locally, it just another operator is going to use some SDK. In this case, it's going to be Kubernetes that send your job, some job, to some execution cluster. I can compare here Kubernetes pod operator to EMR operator, to data prop operator, to any operator that use external cluster or internal, doesn't matter, but it's use external cluster. So the only important thing to use Kubernetes pod operator in any place is that this operator has credential to access your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, until this point is good. So then we go into the local deployment. The only thing is missing is my credentials from Kubernetes. If you remember, it's two sites ago, we can use mounts. I can just mount my kubeconfig folder from local home into Docker Compose, and it will work. So I will be able to test, first of all, from Docker, from Docker Compose, as well as from local machine. Okay, or any question, any other questions there? Um, yes, so the other question is how we try kind and scaffold. So we tried kind, kind is great. It's much better than, 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 than uh, sorry. So first of all, I repeat the question. Uh, the question was about, have you tried kind and another framework? And I think it's a lot of other frameworks. So we tried kind to actually use it, but I can just share the story. All this lecture, it's the result of somebody using kind and spending around three days on trying to make this kind work with local registry and everything. And is instead of doing the task that he had to do around some production code. So kind is nice, it, some it works. Uh, it's probably the best option for now to run Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. But my personal opinion, explicitly when I'm presenting this kind of lecture will be, do you really need to run kind on your local machine to test the airflow? You need to run kind on your local machine only if you're testing Helm deployment of airflow. It's the only good reason to create this mini, mini, mini Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. Okay. So let's talk about Kubernetes. So when I'm going to move to Kubernetes, it's the second one running locally, everything works, everything great. At some point of time, I'm going to move to Kubernetes and I'm going to discover all these things. So it's not like I understand the value of Kubernetes. Then I have to test some new airflow version. I might do it locally. When I need to test something like, you know, like Kubernetes operator, I just might run on Kubernetes. And even more, if I want to run every operator on like, you know, with the Docker, with the GPU capabilities, I will use Kubernetes. So how our development cycle looks, we just run some very small script to create an environment, but it's defined for me how to deploy help, to define to me how to access our CICD, to define for me how to access my Docker Compose. And the nice trick we have done is that by default, this script works with Docker Compose. So then somebody triggers the script that creates my environment, it automatically set up the shell environment to work with Docker Compose. And that's really great. At that point of time, I automatically, any place in my shell, I can, any folder, any, any location, I can just run Airflow, do something, Airflow trigger, Airflow tag list, I can test my code really easily. 
Only then I need to oh, step up one level up. I'll start to do deployment directly to my cluster, or I will do just trigger my CI CD that I know for sure my DevOps guys really take care of this CI CD knows how to deploy Helm, this CI CD knows how to deploy Kubernetes, and that's the thing I want them to do. But this one saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of time, and again, it saves a lot of frustration the moment something doesn't work. Yeah. So, as always, simple is better than complex. It works always, and it's right for DAG offering. You really want to have simple DAGs. It's right for whatever you do inside this every operator, and it's right for the deployment. Okay. I can create a lot of different environments the way I like it. I can create a compose locally. I can do Helm, and I know when to jump from one simple to something more complicated, more production ready. And my coworkers are actually happy. So I can just share. We no, we use Kubernetes a lot, and we have a lot of environments, and all of them deploy it really nice way. We have a nice button say CD, everything works. I can, all, I can always present to our new employee guys, just take a look, there's one click button, you deploy your Kubernetes cluster with your own airflow, you do whatever you want there. But the thing is, most of the people with, you know, with doing some production code, they're not focused on Kubernetes. They're not focused on how to make it work. They are focused on how to make my Spark integration work how to make my Python code use the right, the right library of you know, for some machine learning project, how to offer my deck. And for them, it was always a big overhead. So it was always taking a lot of time, a lot of iterations until they managed to work on Kubernetes and it simplifies things. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's all for today. So first of all, if you have uh, questions, let's uh, talk about it. And if you have suggestions for the next meetup, that's also a nice <laughs> opportunity to say. Any questions on, uh, or any questions on the internet? And then we.